Well, it's that time of the year again where we have welcomed another set in Magic the Gathering. However, not all sets are all that welcomed, especially when certain cards turn out to be a lot worse than we initially thought. With Ikoria, things have become so skewed and blown out of proportion that this hardly feels like a Magic the Gathering set at all. Certain elements of the game and its base have been completely broken in my opinion, and I feel as though we'll be suffering from this set for uh, at least until it rotates out. There are so many things in this set that raise a concern with me, and also makes me believe that Wizards of the Coast is moving in a certain direction that will forever change the way we play this game. Now, since we are in the middle of a global crisis due to the organism that shall not be named, <clears throat> Our way of life has changed dramatically. Well, for most people, that is. Not for me, as I was always an introverted shut-in, spending my days and nights staring at computer screens and video games, but now it seems everyone is living like me. Now, back on topic. Even magic has changed indefinitely, and we are seeing that with how this set was created. I know Wizards creates the outlines for these sets months or even a year or two ahead of time. Well, at least that's what they claim. So I really wonder what the true motivation was behind this set, because everything seems to be falling in pl into place for a particular direction. I'll start this off with the mechanic mechanics of this set. The first one is Companion. Probably the most direct and self-explanatory mechanic in the set that simultaneously raises the most questions. Basically. Every companion card has a prerequisite that your deck must meet before you're allowed to use that one copy of the card as your companion. And companion, in this case, is just a fancy way of saying commander, but... So if your deck meets the prerequisites, you can cast the companion card one time from outside the game, and usually those cards have a pretty dramatic effect on the game state. Now... Some of the prerequisites are basic, like for example, you can use this card as your companion if your deck only has odd converted mana costs and lands. Now, if you're like me, you're asking, well, how am I or my opponent supposed to know if my deck is meeting this prerequisite? Or if my opponent's deck is meeting this pre prerequisite? Like, am I supposed to just ask my opponent, hey, how am I supposed to know if your deck has odd converted mana costs only? My opponent says, dude, trust me. Oh, okay. I mean, I guess the local game store can have someone inspect the deck and sideboard prior to play, but that seems like a hindrance on the game and a way of irritating the hell out of players. And going on a grander scale, what are judges supposed to do in a large-scale event like IQs and Grand Prix or SCG Opens? Like, that's a lot of time to be spent inspecting every single player that has a companion card, and this is just the lower issue. The main issue that I have is the fact that there's no clause saying that if you're using this card as your companion, this is the only copy you can play. It seems rather unfair when I'm playing against an opponent who has Gyruda as their companion, and they cast it, we both mill, and one of the creatures they can cast with a, you know, even converted mana cost is a spark double. So they get a second one, another mill, and then drop an agent of treachery, and then I cry and rage quit. Which is just a hypothetical situation. Hasn't happened to me. Anyway, moving on. I think that should definitely be a rule, because if someone can have that as their companion and say, I don't know, three other copies? Well, that just makes the opponent have a tremendous advantage, in my opinion, because not only do I have to worry about them casting it from the nether realm whenever they please during their turn, I have to worry about them having a replacement or two in their main deck. Ultimately, I believe this is a way of swaying the majority of playing Magic the Gathering. Um community into playing MTG Arena and limiting in-person sanctioned events and with everything that's going on in the world it's quite a convenience that this is happening right now. Companion seems tailor-made for a Arena as the software will automatically detect if the, if the person is fulfilling the demands of the Companion card. Some Magic the Gathering YouTubers have already been calling this since Arena first launch. I'll say, you know, Jeremy from Unsleeved Media slash The Quartering, Mike Hatcher from over at The Magic Historian. And I hate to say it, but they have a point now. I really tried to refuse to believe it because I just loved playing in person and I thought nothing would ever replace that. Well, times sure have changed. Now, the second mechanic is Mutate. 
At first glance, Mutate looked interesting and seemed like it wouldn't be too much of a deal outside of a few cards, but the more I've played against these cards in the game itself, the more I realize that this is almost a broken concept. What they've done with Mutate is basically take the morph mechanic and everything good about enchantments and put it into a bio vat and created this abomination that they've released onto this cursed land. Nearly, nearly every Mutate effect is something an enchantment would do, or maybe an instant or sorcery. But it happens every single time you mutate a creature. It's almost like a pseudo-planeswalker effect, but on steroids because you're getting a pretty powerful creature on top of that. Not only do you make your creature insanely stronger with whatever abilities both creatures have, but you also do things like, I don't know, blow up an enchantment or artifact, draw cards, search out lands, destroy creatures or planeswalkers, make someone sack a creature, discard cards, and the list goes on and on and on and on and on. It's like they went full J.J. Abrams with this set. Not only are the creatures gigantic and out of control, but so are the mechanics. Now, this doesn't go to say that I absolutely hate Ikoria. I am not a huge fan, but I do believe that this is a bit out of the ordinary for Magic. Now, when it comes to specific, uh, specific cards I have Nucci with, and most of, if not all, are companion cards. And the first one I'll go to is Lurus of the Dream Den. At first glance, you think, oh, great, another aggro super engine that respawns creatures with mana two or less. But then I realized it's not just creatures, it's permanence too. Now, I initially didn't think it was that big of a deal until I came around to an aggro deck that also played the best two or less enchantments and realized um, there is something wrong here. I give credit to the opponent for exploiting the strength on this one because, man, I was pretty frustrated in this game. Once per turn, he could recur things like Meyer's Grasp, Dead Weight, Heliod's Punishment, Sentinel's Eyes, all that glitters, etc., completely handicapping my creatures, because at that time in that game I was playing Mono White, until I they were a shell of their former self. Now, sure, it's only one per turn, but the fact that you do it over and over and over again without the recasted card being exiled means that it literally never ends until you find a way to take out Lurus. I can hear all of you saying, But Leet, you paranoid loon, it just dies to removal. Well, no shit. Everything essentially dies to removal. How many cards were there to kill Oko when he first arrived? Didn't stop the insanity that left most players refusing to play standard until he was banned. Hell, and I thought Teferi Timebender was overpowered. My point is, how much damage is going to be done until you get the piece of removal you need to butcher that damn cat nightmare? Then, there's probably two or three more in the deck. Now, I could be overblowing this, but damn, it was really annoying to play against, and I felt completely helpless. Now... I had already used a Banishing Light on an Alci that he had up to a 5 5 lifelink vigilance before he bought, uh, brought this scourge down on me from the Nether Realm, Nether Realm, Companion Realm, whatever you want to call it. So that was the one card. Now, the next one I already mentioned earlier in this video, and that's Gyruda. First glance, it seems pretty good. But again, in action as a companion, it was incredibly annoying to play against. Hell, even a regular deck, in a regular deck, it was absolutely insane. Being able to mill your opponent and then play a high mana cost creature for free is two for the price of one. And isn't, and it's not really what magic is all about. Now, I'm going to take a quick time out here and do a little side rat. Anything that lets you play stuff for free is anti-magic in my opinion. And broken and needs to be removed. I don't care if the clause of the card is you can only play spells on your turn and only two a turn. It's still a mess. Anyways, back on track. As I stated earlier, this guy can be played as a companion while having another bunch of copies in the deck and just makes life miserable for anyone playing against it. There are many other cards that are over the top that I can't even put into words, but I'm sure you'll understand. Cards like Crystalline Giant and Winota. I mean... There's just so much power in this set that it really kind of, um, I don't know, makes it so that there's really only three, four, maybe, competitive decks, and everybody else is just kind of scraping by in ranked matches. So, 
with Gyruda, it's not just it's it, unless you're playing control and you counter the damn spell, the damage is done once it hits the board. Sure, it's only the top four cards, but it's a, an even converted mana cost creature from either graveyard. And if they have been hit like a Spark Double or King Kong, you know, a basically named Kogla, I think that's his name. I don't know. Um, it, it's just the damage is already done, and then you get things like Thassa to do the bounce effect. The the, the oh, okay, not bounce the flicker effect at the end of your turn. I mean, it is just incredibly overpowered in my opinion. So with all that, there's, you know, yeah, as I said, Crystalline Giant and Winota, these cards are insanely powerful as well. Crystalline Giant, I think, is a little bit more doable, I guess, to deal with, but it is still a massive pain since it only costs three mana. And Winota, uh, <laughs> Anybody who's played against Winota, it's, if you don't have an answer immediately, you might as well just concede because the game is over. Um, now, I'm going to go ahead and change lanes a little bit and talk about just the absolutely ridiculously stupid card designs that literally make me think that this set was designed by a bunch of children. Um, I'll start with the most obvious, Sharknado. Oh no god no god please no 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 you finally outdid yourselves wizards you have done it you have become a living meme now this branches me into other pro another problem i have with this overall set this set is heavily favoring ramp decks the amount of mana generation and mana gathering abilities for certain color combinations is beyond belief. And pairing that with gigantic, powerful creatures and companions with, abs well, with absurd companion abilities, I should say, it almost feels like they made this set to stomp out decks like Mono Red, Rakdos, Jun, Sacrifice, Mono White, basically all the decks that people were playing that didn't want to succumb to, you know, these, the, the top of the... Um, pyramid decks, you know? So I feel like, really, once again, Wizards has kind of carved out a section that are going to be just the competitive decks that are going to be played at the top. And if you're not playing them, you're probably not going to win. Um, and it's to the point where if you're not playing a metric shit ton, which is a unit of measurement of removal, you better be playing control because it's just not going to end well. I can't tell you how many decks I've made, if you've watched my other videos, that I actually really enjoy playing, like my Rakdos Menace deck, or my Rakdos Aggro deck, or my Mono White deck. You know, a lot of these other not too, you know, not too crazy over-the-top decks, or just decks that are just fun to play, and you play against these other decks that I've, I've mentioned, and it just kind of, it just sucks the life out of the game for me, and I just, I, I don't have any enjoyment. Sure, it's a challenge, and you can try, but how many times are you going to try when you see Gyruda sitting off of there, and you're playing Mono White, and you basically know if you don't somehow, I don't know, be in a position to win the game by turn six, that you're probably going to lose? It just doesn't seem all that fair to me. So I think Companion... Uh, has really kind of broken the game a little bit, and it's really making things a mess. And, um, you know, so, anyway, moving on. Overall, I think this set had high expectations, but it feels so unbalanced and out of control. I do acknowledge the fact that I may be overblowing this, but this is a first reaction based off of the large amount of gameplay I've had in the standard meta right now. And as crazy as, as it's been, I fear that it may get even worse as more and more combinations are exploited. And standard, once again, becomes a competition between two or three decks and everyone else is just shit out of luck. As per usual. I really hope I'm wrong because I truly love this game and miss the days of old. If you're a... Uh, decorated veteran of Magic the Gathering like I am. You know the days back like during the Urza's block and when multicolored cards were 
kind of cool, but they weren't really part of the main game. And then they came back and everybody was excited. You know, I you were still gathering in Wizards of the Coast retail stores and that weren't owned by Hasbro. And you were just having a good old time. And you were playing Monday Night Arena as a league and not online on a computer. Now, I'm not even going to get into the most obvious part of this. And, well, the most obvious part of this is this horrible idea that they've, best that they've bestowed upon us as these alternative arts. Stop it. Get some help. Because that will just make the video longer, and I honestly just don't have the strength to rip into this Godzilla crap. On top of that, the lore... Well, that's another video in and of itself that I do plan on making. I do plan on making some more, some, some, not more, but making lore videos in the future and doing comparisons between old lore and new lore because when I was growing up playing this game, the lore I grew up with was a w much more complex and uh, much more interesting, in my opinion, now that I look back on it with wisdom compared to the lore that we have now, which is more like a Marvel movie. Now... With all of that aside, I enjoyed those Godzilla movies, but they don't belong in Magic. Not even as alternative art. But let me know what you think down in your down in the comments section. And uh, I hope I didn't piss too many people off. Like I said, for the record, I don't entirely hate Ikoria. I do think a lot of things in this set have obviously been designed to make certain decks a little bit more powerful than they already were. And uh, I think a lot of people will feel a lot better once some of these mechanics are addressed and maybe even some bannings. I'm not one to just come out and immediately stomp my feet and say, ban this card now or I'm never playing again. Uh, I think that's a little more, I think that's a little uh, too much, but I am, I am leaning towards the ban of at least one card. Um, and I guess it doesn't even, I guess the most likely one would be Gyruda, um, but then again, I, I don't know. I really don't know. So, but anyway, um, I'm not here to make anybody mad. I'm just sharing my thoughts, and uh, yeah, let me know what you think, and thank you for watching. Don't forget to hit like and subscribe on your way out.